Well, good afternoon, everybody, and a, a very warm welcome to LSE, both to you in the room and to you online. This event is part of the LSE Festival, <laughs> People and Change, which explores how change affects people and how people affect change. My name is Nicholas Barr. I'm Professor of Public Economics at LSE. I've been teaching economics here for about a million years. You will hear from me for about five minutes, and then I'll pretty much hand over to Martin and to you. It's a particular pleasure to be here with Martin. It's, it's part of the LSE DNA to rattle cages and to seek to improve the life chances of people from less well-off backgrounds. And Martin does both. We met 30 years ago when I was an LSE academic governor, and he was the general secretary of the LSE Students' Union. Uh, at the time... Hot topics were the level of tuition fees and, uh, for overseas students and the design of the UK student loan system. Uh, in tandem with my friend and colleague Ian Crawford, who was one of Martin's early mentors, I argued that the government's controversial student loan was the right direction to go, but it was the wrong type of loan because it was organised like a mortgage bank overdraft. And at the time, Martin and I agreed about some things and disagreed about others. Since then, he's created a whirlwind of activity and achievement, and this is only a very partial listing. Uh, he founded the Money, Savings, Money Saving Experts site and is currently its executive chair. He's an award-winning campaigning journalist and broadcaster. He spearheaded a major major financial justice campaigns, including reclaiming bank charges and inappropriately sold insurance, helping consumers to get back over £10 billion on those two alone. In 2012, he started the Martin Lewis Money Show, which is now a prime-time ITV series. Um, in 2016, he founded the highly important and influential Money and Mental Health Policy Institute charity, which he still funds and chairs. He successfully campaigned to get financial education onto the national curriculum, as well as personally financing over 300,000 free textbooks for all state schools. The Martin Lewis podcast regularly hits the Apple Top 10 UK podcast charts, and just to keep himself busy, he's a newspaper columnist, charity founder, and author. Perhaps even more important, he lives in London with his wife, Click presenter Lara and their daughter. I don't know for sure, but I suspect that within the family, their daughter is at least as effective a campaigner as her father. Um, before getting started, a few words on housekeeping. The Twitter hashtag is LSE Festival. Please put your phones on silent. Uh, the event, as you can see, is being recorded and it'll be made available as a podcast, assuming no technical difficulties. To get us started, I'll put some questions to Martin and then open up for your questions. Um, when we get to that stage, for, for people in the room, please raise your hand and wait for the roving mic. Uh, for those of you online, please submit your questions via the Q&A feature. I hope we'll get a chance to talk about Martin's views on higher education finance, but I want to start, uh, Martin, with your wider activities. Your work has been on on financial literacy has been on the essential basics. The Money Saving Expert website, template letters to banks, paying for school textbooks. My work on pensions starts from the other end, on limitations of financial literacy in the face of complexity. Um, in work I've done with MIT Professor Peter Diamond in advice to the Australian government, we said if people want to make choices about pensions and retirement, the pension system should assist them, but the pension system should also work well for someone who makes no choice, and making no choice should be an entirely acceptable option. And with a background of Martin's um, ITV programme on Tuesday evening, in which the British state pension came up, um, let me start by asking for your thoughts on the boundary between what it makes sense to, for people to be allowed and asked to be responsible for their own affairs and which things are realistically too complicated and require public policy. 
So over to you. Well, first of all, thank you very much. It is lovely to be back at the LSE, my, my home university. Uh, uh, it's, it's a privilege to be here with a former professor of mine. Uh, I now call him Nick. I didn't when I was at university. Uh, and and he's, he's a great man. And apologies, most importantly, for the knees. It was too hot. <laughs> so uh, um, you ask an interesting question. Uh, it's interesting you say the basics of financial literacy because, actually, I think the work of money-saving expert in my general work is, is more advanced than the basics. The financial education textbook, some of the campaigning, uh, in fact, my philosophy is what I can't do in Money Saving Expert, I try and do in my charitable work and working with charities. So, you know, that's funding citizen advice for one-on-one -on -one help or it's working with the Trussell Trust or working financial education. But Money Saving Expert is an empowerment as much as an education tool. And, and some of the stuff on there is relatively complicated, although we don't go into investments because it's a regulated area. And actually, I tend to like to be right. And one of the problems with investments is you can't put it into a spreadsheet and come up with an answer, which you can do with many of the products we look at if you, if you interrogate them enough. I mean, it's getting more difficult in the world we live in. Even energy bills is now becoming a risk-based analysis as opposed to a, a flat, how can you save money? The answer to your question, I mean, if I, if I go in a relatively trite soundbite, is people should be able to engage as much as they want to and, as, and are capable of. So I don't have a problem with, I, I would set no limits at the top end. And in fact, in, in my own life, I, I'm unsurprising in the position in some of the, my own personal finances, I have to sign these sophisticated investor forms, which effectively allows the people who are selling you stuff to abrogate responsibility and you take your own risk if it goes wrong. And I think that's perfectly legitimate as long as you're and, and there, are, there are criteria in place for you to be able to sign that. It's not something everybody can volunteer to do because otherwise scammers would just tell everybody to do it and we'd have a really big problem. But I think that's perfectly legitimate. I think the most interesting answer, argument is the people who want to do nothing or do nothing by default because they're scared and confused. And one of the interesting things I've learned from Money Saving Expert is the, the number of times people have read a guide, understood it, and not acted. And it's fascinating. When I used to do roadshows for my television program, there were two types of questions that generally came up. One were, I want to know how to do something and I want to learn. But probably about 50% of people came up for what I would call permission questions. So they would come to me. They would explain everything perfectly. They would have all the analysis right. They would have thought it through with great detail but I just want to check I'm right before I do it. And that permission issue, the final mile, the last hurdle, is actually one of the greatest difficulties in policy. Because even if we educate people, getting them over the line is critical. You talked about the programme on Tuesday. The programme on Tuesday is about, was about voluntary national insurance contributions. There is currently a transitional arrangement in place which allows you to buy back national insurance shares going back to 2006. It was meant to end in April, but being blunt, since I took up the campaign in February, the numbers of people calling the phone line jumped from 300 a day to 12,000 a day. The phone line has been constantly frozen uh, because they can't cope with demand, they can't train people quickly enough. So it was then extended to July, and classically the government thought, good, we've extended it to July, that'll be fine. And then I called them up six weeks ago and saying, well, now the deadline's in July, I've just got ITV to give me another hour to make sure I can tell all the people who haven't got it yet that they need to go and do it. And then the day before they show, they got in touch and they said, we're moving the July extension to April 2025, because that's the only way we're going to be able to cope with the demand that's now available and out there. And when you look at that, one of the things in their planning when I had a private meeting about what they're going to do to be able to cope with the capacity of the demand of this issue, which was a niche issue, but if I just give you a very simple example for someone who is not due to get projected their full state pension, the maximum cost of a national insurance year is 820 quid. For many self-employed, it's 160 quid. For people only missing partial years, it can be as cheap as 15 pounds, and some people are entitled to it for free. So you got from free to 800 pounds. For someone of typical life expectancy, uh, living at the age of 65 will live to around 20 years, roughly. Um, it's not an economist, economist answer, it's a general answer. So the gain is £300 a year, inflation proofed. £300 a year times 20 is £6,000. The max you'll pay is £800. On average life expectancy, you'll gain £6,000 inflation proofed. That's the best investment you're ever, ever going to get, which is why so many people in the phone lines. 
But I go back, there is a point to this. The point is, they said to me, so we want to digitize the process. Our aim is, we want to digitize the whole process and that label us to get things through and two years is enough to do that. Well, I supported digitization for most of the process. So the last element of this quite is crackers. You have to call HMRC to get an 18-digit reference number. Literally, that's all you're calling them for. It's not advisory. It's effectively your national insurance bank account number. You cannot do it on gov.uk. You have to make a phone call. That phone line is blocked. Clearly, that is a process that digitization would make a lot easier. You just do it on a website. It gives you your number. You can do the payment. But earlier in the process, you have to call the Future Pension Centre, who will help you with the calculations, because you really don't want to get this wrong. And I said, well, I'm slightly concerned about the digitization of the advisory section. Digitization of everything else, clearly we have to leave a route for those who are digitally disenfranchised. This is a retirement issue for people on the state pensions. But let's, let's ignore the people who can't. And actually, my worry is what the Future Pension Centre's done, and everybody who, get, who can get through, and most people can't, but everybody who can get through says, oh, they're great, they really help me, is it gets people over that last mile. And so my big thing to the government was, digitise all the bits that are digitisable, but can we keep some, even if it's web chat, some person-to-person, one-on-one contact because of the last mile hurdle? And the biggest problem we have on money-saving expert, I mean, people, we've trained people, and I don't mean that in a funny way, to, to get through this, is the last mile. So one of the problems you have is when you're asking people about investment, which ultimately how you manage your pension is, is we are not the United States, which is a gung-ho you know, gung shareholder democracy. People here are risk-averse, and if you ask most people, they want savings. They shouldn't have savings in many cases, but they want savings. I mean, if people, people can put savings in their pension as opposed to investing, and many people would, and that would be a, a real problem for our society if they did, because the risk-based element over the years will tend to outperform. So... That's why I was very much in favour of auto-enrolment in, in pensions. I think that's been an incredible piece of transformative nudge economics that was absolutely right to do for society. And I still, in my annual pension show, not the one I've just done, the sort of general pensions one, I always do my big, you're giving, you understand, yes, it's less take-home pay, but you're giving away a pay rise if you opt out. You're giving away those extra contributions. And most people, there are some small circumstances when you should, let's not worry about those for this. Most people shouldn't opt out. And I think as well, a default basis on trying to work the right way forward in pensions is absolutely crucial. We are short-term beasts. We are scared of finance. Not me, to be fair. But as a, as a society, we are scared. Short-term You're beasts. not the right example. No. We are sh- and probably this room isn't either. We are short-term beasts, scared of making financial decisions, absolutely tend to prioritise the immediacy of feeding ourselves and our children, and rightly so. And sadly, that is a far bigger issue in society now than it was five years ago. And aside, just some stats, sorry, I I like to segue. Um, Just, let's just be blunt, over 50% of people who go to citizens' advice at the moment, over 50%, after citizens' advice have done what they can to cut their expenditure, are still deficit budgeting. They still have less income than their minimum possible expenditure. 14% of people in the UK have contemplated taking their own lives due to the cost of living crisis. 49% of people who have missed one bill with a provider have contemplated taking their own lives. At the start of the cost of living crisis, 400,000 people in one year in England have contemplated taking their own lives due to finance, and 100,000 people in England in a year have attempted to take their own lives because of their financial situation. And all of that, when ramped into your question, should we set up defaults that are best action for people if they are too scared, nervous, or, or lack the financial capability to make those decisions, yes, we should. But we need to be incredibly careful who are the guardians of what is the right decision. And I have some suspicion that we need to be careful of politicians being the guardians because they tend to be 
you know, like many chief executives of companies, as someone who's set up as a more, I don't like to call myself an entrepreneur, but entrepreneurial, I always see chief execs of short-termist, and I'm always long-termist. And we need to be careful that long-term right decisions are being made, and the guardians are making them for the long-term, not the short-term political gain. I mean, so many things in this country are absolutely screwed because of our short-term political system. The fact that we haven't come up with a good social care system, being a classic example, that is not something that can be partisan. That is something that has to be done with all party agreements setting up over the next 20, 30, 40 years. And I think pensions is roughly similar. And it, wouldn't that be a nirvana if we got there? But we don't, we're not going to get there. But it would be nice. Thank you. There's two separate problems. Some things are genuinely complicated, however you slice them. I mean, the decision, you know, annuities are inherently complicated and people need advice from a trusted source. A different problem is the short-termism of British politics. This is nothing new. Um, my textbook on the economics of the welfare state, of course, has a long chapter on pensions. Those who've looked at it may have noticed there is no description of the British pension system. Life is too short. It's, <laughs> it's got so complicated that... I don't understand it and don't want to because it's barnacles upon barnacles for short term. You reasons. are a professor of pension economics, aren't you? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But I, I have better things to do. Um, so there is an issue of making things simple that can be made simple. So nest pensions, automatic enrolment, workers who do nothing go into the default fund workers who wish to make choices, there is a choice from a deliberately limited menu of five simple funds that people can understand. That's exactly the sort of ludge and the, the, you know, the last push that you were talking about. Um, I, I think that there's another thing here that we, are, we, we Brits are very bad with. I'm, I'm going to do a game, and I see one of my old, old uh, university chums is in the room, so I'm going to play with Ray. Will you, will you play, yeah, play a game with me? Okay. So everyone can see the coin I've got here. You all see this coin, yes? Yeah. There you go, that's economics for you. Assume a coin. <laughs> right, so I've got a coin here. I'm going to offer you a bet, Ray. Yeah, here's the bet. I'm going to toss this coin, and let's pretend it's a real coin, and I'm not going to make up the answer. Uh, and the bet is this. If you win, I'll give you 100 quid. Oh, I yeah. won't. Uh, not at all. <laughs> and if I win, you have to give me one pound. Okay. And let's pretend this is a real coin. Would you take that bet? It's a proper yeah. coin. I'll give you 100 quid if you win. Who, would you take that bet? Yes. Right. So let's t toss the coin, call it. Tails. It was tails. Was it a bad bet? Yeah, for me, yeah. No. It was a good bet. It was a bad outcome. Ah. Okay. And we are very bad at this in this country, at confusing a decision with an outcome. Now, what, what we do is we, and, and this is crucially important because it biases you to make bad decisions in future if you can't separate the two. Now, it's very easy to see on a binary decision over tossing a coin, you know, it's a 50-50 chance and I've given you to 100 to 1 odds. I mean, it's the best bet you're ever going to get. Uh, and I would never have offered it. Uh, in reality, I'm not a money-saving expert for nothing. But, but you can see it was a good bet. But then we toss the coin and some people instinctively are like, you go, I made a bad bet. No, the bet was a good bet. The risk, the decision, with the knowledge that you had without a crystal ball was a perfectly legitimate decision. You can afford to lose a quid, and the, the upside would have been great. It was actually a perfectly legitimate choice you made. But the outcome was wrong. Now, when that comes into my world is if we looked in 2006, people who got fixed-rate mortgages in 2006, just before interest rates went plummeted, and they all go, I made the worst decision, I fixed my interest. And I go, why did you? Like, you did. Yes, I yeah. did. But, okay, the point about that is... Why did you fix? Did you fix because you thought it was going to be cheapest, or did you fix because you needed surety of budgeting in the future? And if you fixed because of surety of budgeting, you got it, you made the right decision, you had a bad outcome. And unless you're capable of making that rationale and understanding the difference between decision and outcome, then you make future bad decisions because you can become risk averse in an inappropriate way because you assume it is your decision making that's at fault. And what we're actually tremendously bad at, what this comes down to, is dealing with uncertainty. And all of us are bad at that. Should I fix my mortgage? Should I fix my energy bills? Should I marry him or her? <laughs> all of those are uncertain decisions where you hope you're making a good decision, but you could have a bad outcome. And if you beat yourself up, up afterwards when you have the bad outcome, 
As long as you've thought through all the pros and cons beforehand, you're actually going to make yourself even more risk averse to making good decisions in future because you're perverting your concept of decision versus outcome. And I think we are a very risk averse society and tremendously bad at dealing with uncertainty. And schools, I think, actually, we have to be very careful. Life. Should I, can I, sorry, can I, I'm going to take over on something. Do you want to play a game, audience? Should we play a game? I invented this for 15 year olds. This is an LSE audience. You should be fine. Okay. This is my good debt, bad debt test. Are you ready? First question. I've just seen a holiday advertised for £5,000. Payday loan company say they'll lend it to me at only 2,000% interest. I earn £4,000 a year. Good debt, bad debt? Bad debt. Of course it's bad debt. There you go. Well done, children. <laughs> question number two. I've been saving for the last few years for a deposit on a mortgage. I've managed to get a 20% mortgage. We're looking at buying this for the long term. It's a place for me and the family to live. We've got a good 10-year fix, and we're planning to stay in the house for the next 10 years. The rate isn't great, but we can afford it, and it's actually cheaper than the rent that we are currently paying. We're going to pay on our mortgage. Good debt, bad debt? Yeah, of course. Debt can be good. We just said that. It can. You know, we call student loans a debt. I don't think they're a debt. But we also, if you want to get a house, you're going to have to get a debt. Borrowing made rationally is something that can enable us in our society. There's nothing wrong with it. Remember, this was aimed at 15-year-olds. Question number three. I lost my job in the city six months ago. I have a terrible credit score on the back because I've had no income. It's been a real struggle. I've just been offered a job, but we're going to have to relocate to the countryside. I found a place that I can rent that's affordable, but there's no public transport. My work is seven miles in that direction, and my kids' school is six miles in the other direction, and I have a knee condition that means I can't walk or cycle before anyone gets too smart. <laughs> so I'm going to need to buy a car. The cheapest car I found is £2,000. And that is going to push me to the brink of my budget because it's at 20% APR because I've been out of work. I have a three-month probationary period in the new job. If I don't get the job after the three-month probationary period, the fact I've got this car loan is going to leave me bankrupt. But if I don't get the car, I can't get the house, I can't get the job because I just can't get to work and take my children to school. Good debt, bad debt? Not as quick this time, are you? Okay, hey, take a moment, have a think about it. I'll do this by a show of hands on the good debt, bad debt. Okay, who thinks it's good debt? Who would do it? Who thinks it's bad debt? Interesting. What I tend to find is there's an age issue on this. The younger you are, the more you tend to go for good debt. The older you are, you tend to go for bad debt, although it's not a firm correlation. So I may have just aged some of you unfairly. Would you like to know the official Martin Lewis Money Saving Expert answer to that question? It's grey debt, somewhere between good and bad. <laughs> because life isn't certain, and that's the point of that question. Now, actually, if we take on my theory of certainty and doing it right, then if you said it's good debt because you have faith in your own ability that you're going to work hard, you're going to get through the probationary period, and your life is going to be right, and you believe in yourself, and you're willing to take that risk because this is going to advance yourself and your family in a way that is appropriate, then well done, it was good debt for you. If you said it's bad debt, because actually I've got faith that another job's going to come along pretty quickly that I won't have to take that risk with, and I won't have to get myself in the debt, so that I've made weighed up all those decisions, and I think it's going to work well for me, therefore it's bad debt, then good, well done, it's right for you. If you didn't think it through properly, that's the problem. Life is about uncertainties. We as individuals have to deal with uncertainties all the time, and we are crap at it, including me. And therefore... Policy has to help people when actually some things are more certain than people think. For example, almost everybody in this room is going to be in retirement at some point. Almost everybody in this room. But when you're 25, you don't see it as the same certainty as the statistical reality is. So policy does have to help on that. And that was a fun thing to do. If you can get across to politicians, I'm going to be an academic very briefly the distinction between risk and uncertainty. With risk, you have a reasonable idea of the probabilities, flip of the coin, and you can come up with 
good debt, bad debt definitively. With uncertainty, there's a risk, but you don't know how big it is. As you say, will there be another pandemic, etc.? And government tends to treat things as risks when there are uncertainties, so it's just in time rather than just in case in planning for pandemics, etc. But educating the government, but also the wider public, that uncertainty is different from risk and much more difficult. But within our political system, we have a real problem. The, 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 the problem is, I, I call it the U-turn problem. A U-turn should not be castigated. Right? As someone who's run uh, an organisation, Money Saving Expert, and I've set up a number of charities, I have on a number of times made decisions that seem to be good ones that, on something uncertain that turned out not to be good. And then after a while you go, no, that's no good, let's not do it anymore. And that is a perfectly legitimate decision that I made, and it wasn't right, and I couldn't have known, and I go, well, that's a learning curve, and in the organisation everyone goes, yeah, and actually the amount of money we spent or time and resource we spent on trying to build that was perfectly in proportion to what could have happened had it gone right, but it didn't gone right. I take the bedroom tax as the best example of this. The bedroom tax, I mean, I, I try not to get party political, and, and this isn't. Bedroom tax was actually a relatively legitimate idea. Some people on the left might not agree with that, but the, legitimate, the idea of, of, of the bedroom tax was quite simple. What it said was, we have quite a few tending to be older people with kids have left, living in council properties that are a bit too big for them with a spare room, and we have a lot of younger families who are in council properties that are too small. So we'll use a push economics factor to make, give a financial incentive for those people who've got spare rooms to get out of the spare rooms. If we look at it on a purely economic basis, you can understand an argument. Now, there may have been better and softer and more subtle ways to do it. That, that, this isn't the point I'm making. I'm, I don't want to really delve into the policy too much. But the, the, that was the decision that was made. It was something to try. It was tried, and then it was discovered there was nowhere for these people to move. So you were pushing them to do something they could not do. So that's a bad policy. Pretty straightforward, a bad policy. But we have a no-U-turn environment. So you can't say it's a bad policy in politics because then you're castigated. You've made a U-turn, they've made a U-turn. The same way as in our political system. I don't want to get so political today. That when one, when one party adopts another one's policies, the other one gloats about it and says, see, no, we should be going great. We're all working together and all agree. This is a really good thing. Yay, well done, democracy. Ah, but we don't do any of that. And this is all that short-termist problem that we have, you know, for political gain and political expediency, we knock for the wrong reasons, we knock in a destructive way, we throw brickbats at each other in, in the House of Commons, we are anti-coalition, which is where you actually have to work together to make something work, rather and what we want is division, not coalition. And this is the reason why I will never go into politics. Well, you've said there's good debt and bad debt, <clears throat> there's good politics and bad politics. Governments exist to mediate Show me good politics it. somewhere. <laughs> Where's it? What country's got good politics? Oh. It's not a question of good, it's a question of better. Okay. A lot of countries have better <laughs> Least politics. Least worst. Slightly less short term. Uh, no, I mean, there is no such thing as a perfect pension system. There's no such thing as a perfect democracy. One shouldn't dream of that. But one can make things better. And let's say we have more room for improvement in Britain than some other countries. Um, let me ask one more broad question before opening up. I mean, given that the, the theme of the festival is people and change. So this is sort of a personal question for you. You've brought about a whole lot of changes, but which is your favorite child? Which is the one you feel proudest of? So that's a very interesting question. Um, there's lots of geeky stuff I did in the early days when it was all very adversarial and just playing the system, which is actually much more difficult to do now because, you know, we're so big and we'll always spot these loopholes that they know. I, financial education hasn't delivered as in the way I want because, because frankly, we were defeated by the academisation of schools just as we've got financial education on the national curriculum less than 50% of schools need to follow the national curriculum. So then we still have to win hearts and minds to get it taught in schools. I hope it will be money and mental health. I'm incredibly proud of that policy institute. 
you know, I'm very lucky to have set up two really important things in my life. One money-saving expert, which, I mean, in its entirety, MSE, I mean, that, that's, that's the legacy piece. I genuinely believe it's been responsible for incredible social change. The team are wonderful there. And, and the work that it does, and then, it, you know, that's the factory that then powers all my media work. That's where, where it all comes from. And I then push it out in different media. And I think money-saving expert as a cause. But, but it's too big to, to call that one thing. So if I go, money and mental health, which is a passion of mine, was really interesting when I started it. Because the funny thing is, barring the bad guys who are bad guys in everything, there aren't actually, there we discovered there weren't really bad guys. There was just nobody had really thought about it. The systems had been set up without really thinking about the mental health impact. And there are many things we've done, gambling box on credit cards, stopping people having to pay for the mental health and debt evidence form, lots of interesting things. Where we go in future is even more interesting. I mean, the fact that we've done surveys, I can't remember the exact percent, but it's something like 60% of mental health professionals are spending a huge chunk of their time filling in financial forms for their clients because finance is such a big impact. You're four times more likely to be in um, debt crisis if you've got a mental health problem than everybody else. C clinical treatment time for depression is thought to be up to 18 months longer if you've got a financial price crisis. I mean, it's so interlinked. It's a marriage made in hell. And actually, what we're working on now is piloting that in, in some of the, the, the counselling sessions, the AIPT, I think it's called, sessions, actually interlinking debt, debt help within, within mental health counselling. Because until a couple of years ago, they didn't even ask about it. And it's just the, one of the biggest causes out there. So I think that will be, that will be a really big change. But it's fascinating when you look. And, and policy has not yet caught up with where we are. I'll give you two examples. Universal credit. The universal credit system was set up in effect so that people who are um, functionally capable, both intellectually and academically, can work through the uni universal credit system. But when you look at it, the huge numbers of people with mental health and mental capacity pe people are probably a, a, a majority of those on universal credit. And yet the system was not set up to, to help the most vulnerable. And when you're, in fact, the most difficult form on universal credit application, or one of the most difficult, is the form you have to fill in to apply to get a third party to help you with universal credit. <laughs> right? Which is, we're campaigning and the government are listening to, and I hope we'll, we'll have that turned around in the next year. But it was set up, because it was set up so quickly, it was set up with a minimum viable plan. But that was not a minimum viable plan for the most vulnerable, many of those who use it. So that, that, that's the one example out there. The second one that's even more difficult, here's the big one. And this is not a hard stat. But when we look at bailiffs going to people's home, the current rules on bailiffs, oversimplifying, is if people are vulnerable, are declared vulnerable, you have, you have special vulnerable customer conditions. But, and we've not full, firmed these stats up, and it's on a very long work list. But it, it's quite possible over 50% of people whose homes bailiffs go to are vulnerable. So which way do we bias the policy? Currently, it's biased that you're not vulnerable unless you are vulnerable. But is an argument going forward, if it's likely because the link between debt and mental health is so profound, is it likely the bias has to be you're vulnerable unless you're not vulnerable? And that has a profound impact for debt and society. And I think these are the questions that I hope, when you ask me when I retire, I hope the answer will be the change that money and mental health has brought in. You're not going to retire. No, well, maybe not. <laughs> like you. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, another message for government. I mean, the biggest lesson I learned when I was on leave from LSE at the World Bank was the difference between policy and implementation. Strategic policy design, the sort of thing that academics like me do, is in many ways the easy bit. The hard bit is making it work in practice, politically and administratively. And the government seems to think that what they should be doing, that they, they do policy, and then they assume someone will make it work. And that's absolutely wrong. You've get, got to get the people who will be using the policy into the room from day one, and you do that. And it's sort of deeply ingrained in the way... So you money and mental health, when I set it up, one of the most important things was you have a 5,000 people uh, lived experience policy panel. So any policy that we go through, 
when my brilliantly clever team, and they're just down the road, just uh, based at King's, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> based at the King's Research Unit, seven, 17 of them full-time now on money and mental health, when they'd, any policy they come up with as brilliantly clever people is then put through the panel, and this lived experience panel who often say, yeah, but that's not the real problem. And we go, well, we didn't know about that. Let's do the real problem then. And we do the real problem. And then we try and work on that. And it's something I've worked on with Demos. Uh, try, policy has to be practical. And in fact, I wouldn't call money and mental health a think tank. Uh, that was what was talked about in the early days. I said, we'll call it a policy institute because I want it to be a do tank, not a think tank. I'm not interested in thought. I'm only interested in what we can do. There's no, I, don't, I don't particularly want to fund research for research purposes. Sorry for academics out there. I only want to fund research in, in this. I want action where, where we can manifestly change people's lives. Uh, because that's sort of what I've tried to do in my career. It's always about impact. You know, if you're not having an impact, I, I prefer to focus anything I do on, on impact. There was the father of welfare economics said that uh, academic work is either about light or about truth light knowledge for its own sake, or fruit, the uses to which it could put to benefit humankind. And we're both I'm definitely funded. a fruit. Absolutely, we're both, we're both that way. Um, look, let me now open up for your questions to Martin. Um, for those of you online, please type short questions into the Q&A box, and we'll try and answer as many as possible. If possible, please include your name and affiliation. For those of you in the room, please raise your hand. I'll select questions in rounds, and please let us know your name and affiliation, and wait for the stewards with the roving mic to get you. So let's start off with a round of questions. One, two, three. So right, we'll, we'll take the first three. Uh, you, the gentleman uh, by the pillar. Uh, my name is David Derbyshire. A uh, retired uh, headmaster of a private school, boarding school. Um, Martin, I got into the Daily Telegraph for opposing student fees, loans, etc. And I know you have your views on whether it's a loan or a debt or not. I never understood why the young were being given the bill when those who'd already experienced university could afford to help pay back some of that bill themselves. And I just wonder, I did try and put it across to all three parties at the time, uh, and I got absolutely nowhere. There must be a political reason behind I'm it. smiling, because you know the man who invented the system is sitting next to me, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. No, I didn't. <laughs> But that's what but my I cheeky little grip question, is about. I think this the is question, the man who came up with income contingent loans and the structure of the current, him and Nick Barr, in, in, and proposed it to Tony Blair. I'll come back to that. Question, <laughs> question. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for stirring things up. <laughs> the lady at the front. Hi, thank you. Um, my name's Ruby. I just wanted to ask, um, with the mortgage market, how it is at the moment, a lot of the rates are kind of edging up to where they were out of the mini budget last year. A lot of people are in a very dire situation. They're coming off rock bottom rates onto uh, rates double, triple, sometimes even treble. Who's to blame for what's happened? Uh, what, what, yeah, who do you think we should be looking at? Who's, who's got to action change? You know, is it the Bank of England? Is it the FCA? Um, is it the government? Yeah. Thank you. There's a third question over, over lady in the front there. Hi, um, my name's Nadine. I'm from Politics Home. Um, my question is also on, on mortgages um, in terms of what sort of government action or government policy do you think um, should kind of be rolled out for this? You know, essentially what, what she's just said, but also a bit more specific on what policy um, you'd like to see. Where do you want to start? So, I try not to get involved with blame. And student finance is a really interesting one for me because it is probably the biggest political football over the last 20 years. And the amount of spittle over the issue has miseducated generations. And we have never properly educated, you know, we have educated a generation into what we call debt. I don't think it is a debt. But, and never properly educated them about debt. And schools haven't 
properly taken up custodial care of educating them how it works, and more importantly, universities haven't, and they're the ones whom the fees are hypothecated to. So I think, I think there's certainly a problem in communication. Uh, where this all came from is very simple. I mean, you go back, you'll know the stats better than me. I, I, in 1979, it was something like two or three people went, two or three percent of people went to university, uh, and which meant that the, the state, be that the taxpayer or debt funded or however you choose to, whichever your economics is on how the state funds things, let's not do that debate now, was funding the elite three percent to go to university. And the plan was, how do we massify this? And the idea was simple. If you're going to massify higher education, you need to swing the pendulum away from the state and towards the individual. Now, the current debate is where you swing that pendulum and how far. What we're about to see in 2023 is a mammoth swing towards the individual. Uh, currently, for every pound spent on higher education for an individual, on average, the state pays 44p. From 2023, it will be 19p which is why for new starters in 2023 in England and beyond, um, a typical graduate will be paying 50% more than the current graduates, and some will be paying double from 2023 and beyond. Why? I mean, in practical terms, very cleverly, it's not about tuition fees, which is what everybody worries about. Not actually the biggest practical problem, tuition fees. The biggest practical problem is how do I live while I'm at university off the living loan that hasn't gone up with inflation. It's not tuition fees that's changing. And in fact, it's not interest rates, which everyone worries about, but again, isn't the biggest practical issue because not everyone pays the interest. What, what they're doing to, do, to increase the cost are two things. One, they're dropping the repayment threshold. It's like lowering a tax threshold. You pay more from a lower level. So the current repayment is 27,295. 27, you pay 9% above that. You'll now be repaying 9% above 25,000. So if you think of that, that's roughly 200 pounds a year more for everybody over the old threshold and people paying at a lower level, and you will repay until you clear the debt or the longer of 40 years, it's currently 30 years. So the vast majority of graduates will be paying for most of their working lives, the equivalent of 9% extra taxation above the threshold, and that's how you increase it by 50%, but you don't get people up in arms about it because you keep tuition fees, which are what people tend to worry about, even though they're not the actual practical issue. You keep tuition fees at the same level and starve universities of funding by doing so. So that's the system that's coming in in 2023. My, I, I personally think that's a shift too far, but I'm going to preempt, and I think this is an interesting debate. There's a, the, the issue here is about what is progressive, and I know your answer, so let me give you my answer. The way I look at this is I look at this as progressivity within the cohort of those who go to university. And I say that the change we are making is going to be a substantial increase in cost, not for the very lowest who never earn over the threshold, but for low and middle earning graduates are the ones who are going to pay the bulk of the increase in cost. The very highest earning graduates, because they repay more, because the interest is actually being cut so it's just the rate of inflation, and because they repay so quickly, they will actually benefit from the changes. So low to middle earning graduates will pay a lot more, the highest earning graduates will pay a lot less, the lowest earning graduates will pay the same. So I would say this is a regressive change. Nick. <laughs> Before we come to the other two questions, just to say I absolutely refuse to be put in a position where I'm defending the government's policy. Um, they've made a huge mess of things. Um, I had dinner with Alan Johnson when he was higher education minister and the penny dropped, he said, you're not pulling up the drawbridge, this is answering the question, you're widening the staircase. And that's the idea. Why tuition fees and loans? If we want to widen participation, what I call pub economics, pub economics is something that everyone knows is right, but it's wrong. Pub economics says fees and loans harm access. What harms access is not getting good A-levels. And there is huge, overwhelming evidence on the importance of early child development. Uh, access is much more a minus nine months to plus 18 years problem than it is an 18 plus problem. And the worry if you rely too much on taxation, I agree with Martin that, that it's a debate about the balance. If you rely too much on taxation, 
it's going to crowd out what you need to be doing earlier in the system. And when Charles Clark was Secretary of State for Education, um, he slightly lost his rag at a student debate. If I were a real socialist, he said, I wouldn't spend a penny on higher education. I'd spend it all on nursery education. And he was exaggerating, of course, but there's an important grain of truth in that. Martin, back to you. Though. Well, so I was going to say, your progressive element, well, your argument in, in a nutshell, is because the 50% who don't go to university tend to be the lowest incomes by costing the state less, it is progressive. Now, but of course, your level, your progressivity is diffuse. Whether they actually gain, you know, who funds, who funds the state's gain? Is it debt? Is it taxpayer? How does it work? Yours is diffuse. Mine is absolutely direct. You're going to pay more money in your pocket. So that's why I argue it's, it's regressive and you argue it's pro progressive. I think the big change in the last you know, it was 1991, or 90, the, the 880s when you were proposing this, and the early 90s, wasn't it? Yeah. Before it came in, and it came in in 1998. Yeah. Um, the big change is actually, I think, the societal discussion about higher education is changing. The idea people must go to university, and we want everybody university educated. We now have apprenticeships. We now talk about lifelong learning. I think the philosophy of an educated society is changing so that university is not seen as, you know, the ultimate goal is everybody goes to university. And I think that is, that's the, the difference in the debate from when, when you were talking about when it started to where it is right now. And where it is right now is we have to question how many people should go to university, how many people should go to other forms of learning, and who do we put there? And, and that is what the lifelong learning strategy that's coming forward is. I'm not sure we've fully answered the question yet, but I think that's going to morph over the next 10 to 15 years. But, but I mean, there is another issue of short-term politics. The reforms in 2012 that increased student fees from 3,000, a bit over 3,000 to, to 9,000, was actually to exploit a loophole in the way student loans enter the public accounts. If you've been very wicked in a previous life, you need to understand how this works. It's an accounting practice for which uh, a large supermarket was fined 235 million. And this is pure short-term politics, which has driven a coach and And it's now been it. changed, which is one of the reasons why the policy's changed. The accounting exactly. rules have been changed. Well, I can so, for that as well. So that, so that basically loans are much more expensive than they used to be for the government. Exactly. And that's one of the reasons that we've had to have policy change, because it, because it was coming on so much. I'll talk while Nick's having his microphone done. I'll, I'll go on to mortgages. Look, no one can say we didn't know this was coming. I, I, I checked the other day, I wrote a blog on it in 2009, predicting it, and again in 2014. Um, and I, in both of those, I said, it's coming, we just don't know where. So, good caveat. Uh, and then last year, people may remember, I came out there talking about the mortgage ticking time bomb. And I pushed this hard. I actually got quite a lot of flip back and, you know, accused of scaremongering which is what tends to happen when you have election, elections going on and someone saying, a bit like I was scaremongering about energy bills that were going to go up by three and a half times and then there was intervention to stop them. I was scaremongering because I was telling people what a published algorithm with published data input was going to output. I'm not quite sure that's scaremongering. It's just called maths, you know. Yeah. So, um, but of course it was scaremongering. And to be fair, the Chancellor listened. Um, we, we had a mortgage summit. Uh, it was a very scary thing to go. It was the Chancellor, me, the head of the FCA, and the chief execs of all Britain's biggest banks. And I was the only consumer person in the room. And I'd said, could I bring a couple of charities there? And he said, no, I think it's best it's a small number. And I thought, great. So not that I'm outnumbered at all in, in, in this entire room. Um, and we had a productive chat. But it was very interesting. It was an exercise in soft power. It was not an exercise in hard power. And we tend not to exercise hard power in pricing in finance. And the result is we got some, we got some chinks out of that summit. But actually, because the rates weren't as high as in April, and I had, my big point had always been we need to have a summit in case rates go that high. Doesn't mean they will go that high, but there's no point in talking about it when they do go that high. You need to talk about it before. And if they don't, well, we've all wasted an afternoon. Who cares? Um, and so we had it, and some good stuff did come about that, communicating what to do when you're in trouble. You ask me who's to blame. Well, it's difficult. COVID's a bit to blame. Uh, Putin's a bit to blame. Brexit's a bit to blame. Um, the public are a bit to blame. Politicians are certainly to blame. The regulators definitely got a bit of blame in this. The Bank of England certainly got some blame in this. 
But, I mean, to pinpoint it more than that, blame is very difficult. I am not an economist. He is. I am not. I am a consumer finance expert. My stuff is about what we do on the practical side. I personally still struggle as an interested generalist, not an economist, to understand why we push interest rates so high when we have a supply-side-based issue. Why are we pumping interest rates so high? We don't have a demand issue, we have a supply issue. And it, it could be, as a guest, not an expert, so really I'm not a proper source to quote on this, it could just be because the state want to do, don't want to do fiscal policies on it, and they say, the Bank of England, it's your job, and we've only given the Bank of England one tool, and that's interest rates. So the only thing the Bank of England governor can do, because inflation is too high, is not meeting his target, is put interest rates up, because he ha doesn't have any other tools, and all those other tools are in, the, in, the, in government, and government says it's the Bank of England's job. It could be that, but I don't know. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so I think, I think all of that has something to do with it. The bigger question is, what do we do? Well, one of the good things, one of the good things is a policy that's been in place that I have supported for first-time buyers is stress testing. So we have for a number of years, when you get a mortgage, you have been affordability checked, not on the rate that you are currently getting, but on what would happen if interest rates rose to 6 or 7%. And shit's happened. Right? And so actually, I, we're not expecting to see defaults be at, um, be at the level they could have been had we not done that stress. And there's another wonderful thing that's happened, element of sarcasm. Another wonderful thing is the courts are so blocked that actually you can't repossess a house in practical terms anyway quickly at the moment because the court's completely clogged and it can't happen. So that's good. Um, <laughs> not so good for justice, but, but relatively good for people on a repossession basis. Um, so stress testing helps a little bit. I've campaigned against stress testing for remortgaging, which is pointless because what we've had is this remortgaging test that basically says I'm on a 3% rate, I'm moving to a 6% I'm moving to a 6% rate, you're gonna, I want to apply for a 4% rate, you're going to test whether I can afford a 6% rate, and if I can't afford a 6% rate, you're going to say I can't get the 4% rate so I'm going to move on to the 6% rate. I was like, duh. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. So we've, we've Unchink that a little bit, but not enough. So the first, the first practical terms we need at the moment are, the reality is people signed up for contract with financial services companies. Those financial services companies are increasing their margin, margins, pushing on costs to mortgage holders and not giving any benefit to savings. Personally, if I were in power, I would be pushing them either to provide more release, relief for mortgage holders or to reward savers better, rather than to be increasing their margin, margins for shareholders. And I think that we should expect that social, uh, as a social basis. And if not, I'd like to encourage everybody in society to ditch their savings with these banks that aren't paying them enough and move to where you get more money and then they'll realise at least they have to reward savers, which consumer power could angle in. But I think all we're going to be able to do at the moment is look at forbearance measures. How we do not want mass repossession, we do not want mass defaults. What can we put in place to enable people to, if they're in trouble, to ask their lender for help, to be given forbearance, or at least to be talked through other alternatives that are out there? The one thing I regret that I didn't win in that mortgage summit was I wanted an agreement of reversibility. So I wanted, my big ask was I wanted mortgage policy, and this is what I would do, I wanted mortgage lenders to have a suite of tools that they could offer people who were in trouble. I'll, I'll just give you a really simple example. Increasing your term. That if you had a 20-year term, you could increase it to 30 years. So you're still making repayments, but you're making lower repayments. Or you could take a mortgage holiday. But if you increase your term over 30 years, the problem is you're going to pay more interest because you're spreading it. So what I wanted was I wanted people um, to be able to apply for an extension of their term but have an automatic right within two years to reverse to their old term. Oh, right. So that you could take it as a temporary break but then you could bring it back. Uh, the same on a payment holiday. That you could, take a temp you, could t or you could take a temporary lower payment but you could then say I want to go back to my higher payment, it won't affect my credit score. Because I worry that people tend to have these psychological barriers, this is going to hurt my credit score, this is going to hurt me in my long term, so I'm going to tr struggle through and they struggle through and then they get to the cat catastrophic phase that means they can't pay anymore. Whereas I wanted these softer landings for people, this is, wasn't to, you know, to give people softer landings uh, and that way they can muddle over the hump while they rearrange their finances, and then once things hopefully get better, they can reverse it without any long-term impact. I didn't get that. 
That, that, that's one of the things I would have done. That sounds like such obvious common sense. It, it's mind-boggling that it has But the happened. answer was, you know, that the problem was I couldn't quite work out where the problem lied between the regulator and the banks. Because the bank said to me, it's the regulator because we can't do this without doing affordability and credit checks again. To allow, we will allow people to reverse, but they've got to go through the same checks as if they were asking for it the first time. And the regulator saying, well, you can, but you can't. And, as long as, and, and actually, what it needed was, you have to do this, get into a room, you change the regulations that allows them to do it, and you have to do it. And actually, I think what happened is rates didn't go up perversely, I'm not saying I wanted it quickly enough for us to get in that emergency thing and the slow rise that we've had. So we didn't, we're now at the predicted April heights, but we're at them at June or going to be at them at July or August, actually took away the, the, the urgency of action that we had back in that mortgage summit. We're rapidly... But well done, because I've actually not said that anywhere in the last three or four weeks. The Today programme wanted to be on the other day, but I was knackered after my show and I didn't do it, so I've said it here, so there we go, well done. <laughs> Great. We're rapidly running out of time, and I want to make sure there's time for at least... Uh, could you give us a couple of online questions? Um, do, 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 do. Hi. Oh, there we go. Um, question one is from Jason, who is a recent LSE graduate. And he well done, Jason. And he asks, how worried should we be that future governments will raid our pensions or ISAs? How high is the risk that they won't exist anymore in the um, version that they're in at the moment by the time we can actually benefit from them? So that's question one. Well, let's do that quickly. I mean, I, again, I'd probably push... I, I think it depends what you mean by raid. Raid in its entirety, very little. Ra raid by subtle changes, well, that's what they do. Ask Gordon Brown. Yes. Um, so in terms of their existing, look, I think there's a lesson on student finance here. Student finance has been negatively, retrospectively changed. I campaigned when it happened quite vociferously. You know, I, I had lawyers to do judicial review over the government because I thought it was outrageous, and we, we managed to get a U-turn from press power and media power rather than legal power in the end on that one. And that was still only a threshold tweak. The, the change to student finance that's just coming in in 2023, and I didn't say this earlier because I'm not in a practical session, is for new starters. Existing students who started under the old system do not have that change. Anyone who's previously been to university do not have that change. We now have at least five different plans of student finance running consecutively in repayments in the UK. Because substantial negative retrospective change like that, if it's going to come, is more likely to come such as when we changed, it wasn't negative, but when we changed the old state pension to the new state pension, we changed the system from a certain date for all people who retired from that date. And my suspicion is, because of the uproar that you would have on changing legitimate expectations for people, it is not impossible. Parliament is only competent. It can do what the hell it likes. It can declare that Russia is part of Britain if it wants. It would legally be part of Britain in Britain. Not sure the Russians would agree. But, but you know, it can do that. It's always possible. It's not risk-free. I think it's unlikely. I think if any negative changes, substantial negative changes come, they would be for new, not for existing. But Nick's probably better on that than I am. We'll have a second question. And the final question. Do you agree? Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> he was my professor at one point. So, Martin, you're known for counting your steps. I am. If you could swap shoes with somebody for one day to affect the most positive change, who would that be? And that's from Laura in Berkshire. Wow. Is that to get the most steps or for the most? Because the most steps is very easy. If change anyone... to your waistline. Well, I okay. I would. Have any of you been to Carnaby Street? Okay, there is a very evil woman there who is my enemy. <laughs> and every time I walk past her, she upsets me greatly. Have you seen? It's a piece of art. You know what I'm talking about. There's a piece of art of a woman who is just walking constantly. And she's not even bloody wearing a Fitbit. It's a digital display, and she's just there. It's a image of her just walking. And every time I see it, I get very upset by it. So if I could change places for my steps, I would give her my Fitbit. She's doing what she's doing. So she'll be doing 180 steps a minute. So what we're going to go, 1,800. So we're going to talk about what? So she's going to do about 10,000 steps. Probably, yeah, 10,000 steps an hour. So that's 240,000 steps a day. I only average 25,000. So it'd be, a ten, it'd be a tenfold increase on me. So she can have my Fitbit. But what I'd really prefer to do with her is pull the bloody plug. And on, poli <laughs> and on policy. 
Let's take a couple more, last two questions. Um, Ray and the lady behind him. Um, hi, Martin. Um, do you think really this whole thing is all about ideology versus economics? Economics is a science. Hopefully it's rational. And ideology is not rational at all. It's a belief system. That could be irrational. I, I'm Again, not I sure. say, let, let's, take, let's take the question okay. from behind you and then, then, then you can answer them okay, all and we can wrap up. Um, hi, Juliet Waldinger. I'm also LSE alumni. Um, I am of the opinion and I feel financial institutions have responsibility to fund projects which financial literacy, financial inclusion, financial education. I was just wondering if you have ever experienced them coming to ask for advice about what they can do about it, any projects they fund, and what generally your views are about whether they have, what they're doing about it, whether they do have responsibility and they're just ignoring it. So if you'd asked me about their responsibility, I'll, I'll answer that then, I'll ask the rest. If you'd asked me about their responsibility 15 years ago, I would have said no, and I would have actually said it was a relatively dangerous concept. The dangerous concept is I think there's a lot of whitewashing that goes on with social responsibility. And, you know, if your, job's your, if your job is there to make money for shareholders, then you make money for shareholders, and if we want them not to do it, then we have to do it by regulation or legislation rather than by expecting them to have goodwill if we want them to help people. I think since, certainly with banks, that we bailed them out and they were too big to fail, I think that actually gives them, now you actually have to have a social responsibility because, you know, we all bailed you out. So when we're in times of trouble, you shouldn't be increasing your margins as you are doing right now. This is not a time for increasing the spread between mortgages and savings, but they are doing. Uh, and, and I'd prefer to focus on that than them funding events because funding often tends to be branding. Look, I, the, the answer is, if they came to me, I wouldn't answer because I'm not an expert on what they should be funding. We get some great funding from financial institutions for money and mental health, both in terms of we do mental health accessibility where we do audits of institutions and they pay for that, which all money stays in the charity, obviously, and helps fund our other activity, as well as you know, great sponsorship of research that we do, always fully editorially independent. And I do think many financial institutions, when you meet... Their, 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 their teams who are there to do this, they tend to be really great people who are well-meaning. You know, and we've got some members of my old team who've gone off to go and do that for, for people and, and work. But it, it's always threepence in the big scheme of things. And there is a question, how much do we want our banks to be funding these activities and how much should that be taxpayer funded and we actually want our banks to be giving better products to the people who are engaging with them so we have less vulnerable people in the first place? So I'm somewhere between the two, but they, they don't come to me because I, I do what I do, and, and it's, not, it's not actually those type of projects. To answer Ray's question, I think you have more faith in the science of economics than I do, <laughs> that, that it can give definitive answers. I, I think it can certainly point in the right direction, but I think we have more theories than laws when it, in economics, uh, and, and that's probably the right way to adopt it. In look, ideology, ideology, once you start to get politics to be faith-based ideology, then we're always going to be in trouble because it becomes unarguable and you have people who are able to lie uh, and, and lie with impunity because people believe them in, in, you know, both in this country and abroad um, because people believe them as, an, as a matter of faith. And I think that always gets very difficult. And, uh, and as a person whom I get many people who say things to me like, I didn't quite understand what you said about that, because, but I'm doing it because you said to, which just makes me want to poo my pants because my whole thing is about you have to understand it and make the decision for yourself. A lot of people are too trusting and too, too, too credible without thinking through issues for themselves. Um, I'm not sure economics, economics can solve stuff. And, and I don't know if this was you know, a subtle going back to we've had enough of experts, and it was that comment. I, I, I mean, I actually have slightly different... I, I, my views on Brexit were more people understood what it meant and still voted for it than many people think. I know at the time I wrote a guide on how to decide how to vote over Brexit, not how to vote. And actually in the feedback on it, it was roughly, I think it was 55% or something said they'd vote remain after it and 45% said they'd vote leave. And they came to me and both said, thank you, you've helped me make my mind up because it was a risk-based analysis. And there were a lot of those people who said, I'm voting leave over sovereignty and politics, even though I think economically I'm not sure this will be good for the country. And I think uh, we, we, we tend to have been a bit blinded to that now when people go, oh, if these people... I think more people knew what they were voting for than we give them credit for. 
and, and I'm not going to get involved in which was right or which is wrong. Ideology isn't always wrong. Belief can be good. You know, sometimes, if you ask me what we should have done over energy over the last winter, even though the state paying money to support people on energy probably isn't necessarily the best thing for the state, my ideology is we can't let people freeze or starve and we have to prioritise that over the economic science of it. Sometimes ideology isn't always bad, sometimes economics isn't always right. My, my line is, Nick's probably about to shut me up, my line of, of being an LSE student, and what you have to understand, is... The people who came here because they want to change the world really need to understand that economics matters. The people who came here because they want to make billions really need to understand that their impact on the world matters. Yeah. The two are symbiotic. I was going to say, we're going to have to wind up, but I just wanted to say ideology is incredibly important. Martin and I share an ideological drive to make the world a better place, particularly for people from uh, less well-off backgrounds. That's ideology. What is bad is when ideology takes precedence over good analysis. Now, good analysis and ideology won't necessarily give you a definitive answer, but at least you're trying to get the process right. It's, it's subverting the process that's bad. Look, alas, it's time to wind up. Uh, we could clearly go on for hours. Um, remember, there are still other events at the festival. So do take a copy of the, the programme uh, on the way out or, or check online. Um, of the things we've talked about today, knowledge is enormously important. It's what LSE is all about. And there's lots of very knowledgeable people. But you also need trust. And trust is absolutely priceless and incredibly rare. You can replicate knowledge. It's what I do as a teacher. It's a wonderful thing to do. You can't replicate trust. It has to be earned. And it's no accident, as you've heard this evening, why Martin has been voted the most trusted man in Britain. The problem is you, you, can't, you can't replicate it. And how you, how, do, how you do that, I don't know. Me neither. <laughs> well, Martin, it's been fascinating. No surprise there. Um, Lovely to have you back, and a, a huge pleasure personally. Uh, social justice, as I've just said, social justice really matters. So all power to you and your campaigns. Thank you Thanks very, very much. Well